Well, I'm going to uh, uh, read a very short statement. Uh, the, the subject was pretty vast, and I thought if I uh, uh, provided a short statement, and then uh, that it might generate questions, which uh, uh, at least might be the best way to do it, because I really want to know what you want to know about this. So let me read this statement. In 1967, because of my concern about the rapidly growing use of the dangerous drug marijuana, I began my studies of the scientific and medical, medical literature with the goal, goal of providing a reasonably objective summary of the data which underlay its prohibition. Much to my surprise, I found no credible scientific basis for the justification of this prohibition. The, the assertion that it, is a, that it is a very toxic drug is based on old and new myths. In fact, one of the many exceptional features of this drug is its remarkably limited toxicity. Compared to aspirin, which people are free to purchase and use without the advice of a physician, or a prescription for that matter, cannabis is much safer. There are well over 1,000 deaths annually from aspirin in this country alone, and there has never been a death from marijuana anywhere. In fact, when cannabis regains its place in the U.S. pharmacopoeia, a status it lost after the passage of the Marijuana Tax Act in 1937, it will be seen as one of the safest drugs in that compendium. Moreover, it will eventually be hailed as a wonder drug, just as penicillin was in the early 1940s. Penicillin achieved this reputation because, for three reasons, it was remarkably non-toxic, it was, once produced on the economy of scale, quite inexpensive, and it was effective in the treatment of a variety of infectious diseases. Similarly, cannabis is exceptionally safe, and once free of the prohibition tariff, it will be significantly less expensive than the conventional drugs it replaces, and it already has an impressive record of versatility, a record which continues to expand. Given these features of this drug, it should come as no surprise that its use as a medicine is growing exponentially, or that individual states have established legislation which makes it possible for patients suffering from a variety of disorders to use the drug legally. Beginning with California in 1996, 13 other, 13 other states in the District of Columbia have followed suit, and others are in the process of enacting such legislation. Unfortunately, because each state arrogates the right to define which symptoms and syndromes may, with a written recommendation from a physician, be lawfully treated with cannabis, many patients with legitimate claims to the therapeutic usefulness of this plant must continue to use it illegally and therefore endure the extra layer of anxiety imposed by its illegality. Of those states which now allow medical use of cannabis, New Jersey has imposed medical criteria which are so restrictive that I would estimate that only a small fraction of the pool of patients who would find marijuana to be as or more useful than the conventional drugs it would displace will be allowed access to it. Regardless of the symptoms or syndromes for which cannabis is useful, it is invariably less toxic than the conventional drugs it displaces. It is most important not to make any legislation aimed at making it easier for patients to use marijuana as a medicine, not be too restrictive 
lets it substantially defeat that goal. And I would be delighted to answer questions about this, uh, this medicine. Any questions from uh, the committee? Yeah. Um, I'm just leaping through his um, document that he shared with us that we have here. And he talks about uh, the fact that currently there's any anecdotal information data about medical marijuana for medicinal purposes. Can you tell me if um, there's been any recent information that has taken us from anecdotal to now something more substance to kind of show this uh, impact on our uh, patients in their, um, in their position? Sure. Doctor, uh, Representative Wheatley has a question. He's uh, referring to one of your 2005 publications uh, that cited anecdotal evidence in support of medicinal marijuana. Is there now uh, medical evidence, scientific evidence, clinical evidence to support uh, your conclusion that marijuana has a uh, beneficial uh, medicinal value? <laughs> Yes, uh, let me answer that question. First, uh, Representative Wheatley, I would uh, remind you that, uh, you know, uh, in the days of Sir William Oldham, uh, let's say from the last half of the 18th century through uh, uh, the time when uh, large scale double blind studies uh, of drugs, the, goal, the present goal for the acceptance by the FDA of a drug as uh, uh, a le legitimate therapeutic substance which can be distributed. Uh, but all the clinical uh, data that we have uh, up until that time was anecdotal. So, I mean, medicine uh, didn't begin with a double-blind study and the, and the use of treatments. Uh, uh, fortunately, digitalis, for example, didn't have to wait until large double-blind studies, nor did aspirin, nor did penicillin, nor did insulin. Uh, these were evaluated on the basis of, of clinical medicine. Would you believe that the first trial of penicillin uh, took place in 1941? It was given to six patients with different uh, 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 grand positive infections like pneumonia or cephalopox or what have you, and all of them uh, were treated successfully. And on that basis, it was immediately accepted as a uh, an antibiotic. Now, when you consider marijuana, the fact is that we have mountains of anecdotal evidence. And if you wish to see a, a few little peaks of that mountain, you could take a look at my uh, medical marijuana website, www.rxmarijuana, as though rxmarijuana were one word, uh, .com. Now, uh, what has happened, you know, when I wrote the book, Marijuana Was Been Medicine, there were no uh, studies, it was all based on anecdotal evidence. It was like, like a book that could have been written in Sir William Ozla's time. Sir William Ozla, who said of the treatment of marijuana, uh, of migraine headache uh, with marijuana, it is the superior treatment. It is the primary treatment. Now, so my book was based on anecdotal evidence, but what is happening now is that we are getting these double-blind studies. They, they are few and far between, and many of them can, are involved, are, are carried on by the uh, GW Pharmaceutical uh, Company in Britain, which produced Sativex, which will be a drug uh, which I expect to be approved in this country very shortly. But, but they have done large double-blind studies to satisfy the authorities in Canada and Spain and some other nations, and soon in the United States and Britain, uh, Britain already in the United States, I think, soon, uh, that these studies show in only one of the many symptoms and syndromes that marijuana is effective, uh, what we say in marijuana we can say. This is a superb drug 
So treating the spasticity, the pain, and even some of the other symptoms like a urinary incontinence in multiple sclerosis. And, I, and the other studies that have been done are all, they, they got their, they got the idea that maybe this, we should look at this as a or whatever other con, uh, pharmaceutical cannabinoid they've developed. They got the idea from looking at this anecdotal evidence. And each time they have taken one of those things that has been demonstrated through anecdotal evidence, the, the, the study has affirmed that this has a place in the treatment of that disorder, whether it be multiple sclerosis, migraine, uh, uh, ulcerative colitis, uh, glaucoma, a whole host of different uh, uh, symptoms and syndromes, the list of which uh, grows uh, as we speak. Thank you, Doctor. Any other questions from the committee? One more question, Doctor. One second. Sure. In, in his, in his um, testimony that I'm reading right here, he talks about what he thinks the real reason the government, uh, the reason why the federal government doesn't want to legalize or recognize it as a big uh, drug. And he talks about it because once people get to see that it doesn't have any field impact, that then they would want to legalize it for any and all purposes. Can you help me understand his thoughts around that process? Like his statement that federal government and to an extension state governments um, are more inclined to not legalize or recognize this as a uh, medical drug um, because of not for what it does for the patient, but what it means for. Because I asked you previous question around the slippery slope. So essentially, he's kind of addressing that. So I just want to hear this kind of. 